All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome again uh, to the, another Garrett Research Seminar for the uh, Department of Archaeology. I am one of your co-hosts today, Joshua Fitzgerald. I'm an ethnohistorian, museum specialist in Mesoamerican and Spanish colonial material culture. Uh, currently, I'm the Rubinoff JRF here at Churchill College, and I welcome you to the Garrett Research Seminar. Thank you for joining us for Dr. Ryan Esperson's presentation, No Dollar Too Dark, uh, Free Trade, Piracy, Privateering, and Illegal Slave Trading in the Northeast Caribbean, Early 19th Century. Please be aware, uh, let me go ahead and stop sharing for just a moment. Uh, please be aware that this meeting is being recorded. So I ask you to take them a moment to mute yourself. Uh, and though the chat box will be disabled during the duration of the talk to avoid any disruptions, and the talk will take about 50 minutes, uh, you can still submit your comments or questions to your hosts directly, and we can follow up with you. And then we'll open it up for a discussion following the presentation where um, Oliver Ansek, the, uh, my, my co-convener, will be facilitating the discussion with our special guest. Uh, considering today's topic of piracy, I would be remiss to not mention an uh, out of this world connection I came across earlier today. Uh, did you know that Dorothy Garrett was attacked by space pirates? True, the pathfinding Garrett is known for many things, but intergalactic travel and piracy studies are not high on that list. But after a quick Googling, lo and behold, she has a fictitious starship named in her honor, the USS Dorothy Garrett from the Star Trek canon. And of course, her starship millennia from now will boldly go to investigate a migratory pocket nebula where captain and crew will only just fend off pirates from Orion. We will leave it to our astroarchaeologists to recover the motivations for the seemingly piratic people living on the margins of Orion's belt. But needless to say, Garrett's legacy may remain always ahead of her time. Now, back down to earth, and the Atlantic. This week's series for the North Atlantic uh, Highway Materiality Mobilities throughout Europe, Africa, and the Americas gathers world-renowned experts to help us wayfind through their new findings, uh, the theme being human and material mobilities, migrations, and immobilities. And we hope that you will continue to attend. Uh, please do find uh, the links to the Cambridge Archaeology's YouTube channel to see our previous speakers, and, uh, and you can follow uh, along with social media platforms using the hashtag Garrett. Now, on behalf of my fellow co-conveners, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Demeray at Churchill College, and Oliver and I, and the McDonald Institute for Archaeology Research and the Cambridge Americas Archaeology Group, I will introduce Dr. Ryan Esperson. Dr. Esperson, his work has focused on the Dutch Caribbean and Northeastern Caribbean over the past 15 years. He earned his PhD from Leiden University in 2017 under Corin Hoffman and Jay Haverson Visser. He lived on the island of Seba, Dutch Caribbean from 2011 to 2018 and co-founded the Seba Archaeological Center in 2012 as a youth-centered NGO to help Sabans participate in the discovery of their own history through archaeology. Over the years, as Seba's resident archaeologist, he helped Sabe Arc grow into a museum with a fully furnished lab and artifacts storage facility. During that time, he led surveys and excavations in over 50 terrestrial and maritime sites between Seba and St. Eustacia, or Stacia. And along with the Seba Conservation Foundation and island government led the establishment of the Seba Heritage Trail and Seba National Park, both of which were opened by the Dutch royal family. He also served as Seba's representative to the Dutch Caribbean UNESCO Working Group. He's a member of the Dutch Caribbean Maritime Heritage Working Group with the Dutch Ministry of Culture and the French Caribbean Maritime History Working Group with the Université de Antilles in Martinique. He has published on osteology, class, and gender, among other topics. And starting this month, 2022, we are happy that he will be joining us as a Murray Curie postdoc with the McDonald Institute uh, with a project that he will share with us now. Uh, Dr. Esperson, the Zoom floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so we'll begin here with uh, the title of the project, No Dollar Too Dark, Free Trade, Piracy, Privateering, and Illegal Slave Trading in the Northeast Caribbean during the early 19th century. Uh, next slide. So to begin, um, we're in a 
slightly more obscure part of the uh, Caribbean. So to familiarize everyone here in the audience, um, we're talking mostly about the islands of uh, the Danish island of St. Thomas, uh, the Swedish island of St. Bart's, and the northeastern Dutch islands of St. Martin, Seba, and St. Eustatius. We can uh, see them here in the map. And there's also Crab Island, um, more presently known as uh, Vieques, uh, which comes up quite a bit as a, as a pirate haunt, which uh, we'll discuss later. Next slide. So uh, before we jump into um, the early 19th century itself, it's best to start with the chronology of events that uh, led up not only to this period, but also helps to inform uh, the events that uh, transpired there. So we can go as far back as uh, the War of Jenkins' Year uh, from 1737 to 1743, which occurred basically in how you how you, uh, how you can imagine there, it was a war over uh, a severed year and uh, <laughs> lasted for almost uh, six years between uh, the UK and, and Spain and followed by the Seven Years War between, uh, sorry, that should be a seven, yeah, 1756 to uh, 1763. So during these times, um, the Danes and also the Dutch uh, remained neutral in the war and they took advantage of this and also um, enterprising merchants and other residents took advantage of their neutrality to flock to St. Eustatius and St. Thomas during these times. So during the two periods of war, their population swelled and after the wars ended, um, the populations declined once again. Um, because the neutral trade during this time was uh, very profitable. And also between the 1730s and 1763, uh, so East Asia in particular was a profitable base for an illicit quote unquote trade with uh, what were then called the neutral islands, which were St. Vincent, Dominica, St. Lucia, and Grenada. So these were islands that uh, were left officially uncolonized uh, between uh, Britain and France, although there was informal settlement there. And those informal settlements, uh, settlements sorry, uh, still required. Um, goods. There were plantations uh, operating there especially, and uh, these plantations were covertly furnished with goods uh, through St. Eustatius, as well as they served as buyers for sugar as well. So uh, in 1755, Dutch colonial officials fully committed to St. Eustatius as the free trade port. So this is another catalyst that really served to draw merchants to the island. Uh, there were no import taxes and they did not restrict entry to any ship regardless of uh, their nationality. Uh, the Danes followed in turn uh, with this in 1764. So again, with the U.S. Revolutionary War between 1776 and 1783, St. Eustatius boomed as a covert and vital supplier uh, to arms to the American revolutionaries, as well as a mail career to them too. And uh, all the meanwhile, uh, Britain took note of this. And in 1781, uh, St. Eustatius was sacked by the British Admiral uh, Rodney. Um, over quite some time, actually, even after the island was sacked, he continued to fly the Dutch flag in order to lure ships in in order to capture those ships and claim those prizes and uh, eventually the island was uh, the same year returned to the Dutch and then followed by a mass hurricane in uh, August of uh, August 31st that year and uh, despite that it still um, began to prosper and it prospered all the way until 1795 when it was finally captured by the French who imposed taxes and the merchants that were there uh, had finally had enough of this so they fled to uh, Curacao, St. Thomas and St. Parks for the most part. And also in 1784, St. Bart's was purchased uh, by Sweden from France, and uh, they also turned this into a free trade port. Uh, next slide. So then we have the instability caused by the Napoleonic Wars. So eventually all non-Spanish Caribbean islands um, were successfully captured by the British, uh, except for St. Bart's. And some islands went back and forth um, between uh, between ownership, but uh, essentially all the islands uh, returned more or less to their previous owners by 1815. Uh, however, um, there's a stipulation that uh, Britain placed upon uh, the new kingdom of the Netherlands in that St. Eustache, they did not want St. Eustatius returning uh, to its former prosperity as a free trade port. So under British pressure, uh, there was a tax uh, regime imposed on St. Eustatius for incoming ships. So again, it diverted those ships away that would have otherwise gone there to St. Uh, Marks and St. Thomas and also to Curacao. So then in 17, 1807, sorry, in uh, 1808, uh, we had Portugal and Spain that were captured by France. Uh, the Portuguese royal family relocated to Brazil, becoming the new seat of the Portuguese empire and uh, Spain 
uh, didn't uh, it caused issues over there with uh, their legitimacy to their Spanish American colonies. So they see that um, while well, the mother country has fallen and the Spanish American colonies are effectively forced to look out for their own, which they've been more or less doing for quite some time already. So independence rebellions began uh, successively starting with uh, New Spain, which is now Mexico, uh, and also Buenos Aires and New Grenada. Uh, which com composes roughly uh, present-day Venezuela and Colombia. So on top of this, we have the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade. So just to keep in mind here, there's a, a very big difference between abolition and emancipation. So abolition of the transatlantic slave trade means the, the trade in enslaved Africans across the Atlantic Ocean was stopped. However, the institution of slavery remains, which um, is very, very key here. So abolition, of the transatlantic slave trade uh, started with Denmark in 1803, Britain in 1807, and the Netherlands in 1814. However, this of course leaves uh, loopholes wherein there is a regional slave trade permitted um, within the same nation's colonies. So if um, East Asia just needed enslaved Africans from Suriname, that was possible, but they couldn't trade, say, with St. Kitts. Um, and also since the institution of slavery remained, there remained a large demand for enslaved Africans. So this fueled a, a very thriving uh, legal transatlantic slave trade um, on behalf of Britain and uh, the Netherlands. So even though other countries like Spain and France were not necessarily recognizing that this transatlantic slave trade was illegal, um, there's a joint commission set up by uh, Britain and the Netherlands to um, to go and track down and, and, and uh, prosecute uh, ships in court that were uh, trespassing in, in certain waters and so forth in, in Africa. And of course, this, this also left a lot of loopholes uh, legally, which we'll get into later. But uh, nonetheless, it's important to know that this, uh, this field, the, the illegal transatlantic slave trade. Uh, next slide. Also, during this time, we have the War of 1812 which actually happened between 1812 to 1815, um, which turned Baltimore into a center for U.S. privateering against the British Empire. And it's um, quite convenient that uh, just after the war ended, uh, we have um, Spain, which is now turning its attention after it gained its own independence to seek to regain its own American colonies. So at this time, Spain had no functional navy, but also the Republican armies also had no functional Navy. So as a result, both started hiring privateers. And of course, since the Napoleonic Wars had just ended, you have a generation of young soldiers who basically know nothing but war and were raised as soldiers and seamen. So you have uh, absolutely no shortage of, uh, of crews for privateers. Uh, it's been, so this uh, was all, all across uh, Western Europe, but then also with uh, the US out of Baltimore, particularly. <coughs> Sorry. So um, swarms of privateers enter the Caribbean Sea, uh, both on, uh, on behalf of Spain and then on behalf of uh, the rebellious American, Spanish American provinces. Um, then on top of that, since there's so many privateers operating here, it made a perfect cover for piracy, but a different kind of piracy wherein these pirates were posing as privateers. So there is a very um, a large emphasis on legal posturing here. So doing everything you can to make your actions not only seem legal to any parties that need stopping you. I'm oh, sorry, you're out here. <coughs> but also to the crews themselves, which is important to make your crews at least believe to themselves or even lie to themselves that they were not actually, they weren't pirates. We are not pirates. We're privateers. You know, we're actually fighting for a cause, even though legally they were not. So after that, we have the, uh, the Cisplatine War between 1826 to 1828 between the Empire of Brazil and Buenos Aires. <clears throat> so what happened here is uh, Brazil imposed a blockade on Buenos Aires, which is very successful. So uh, Buenos Aires ships and merchant ships in particular had a very hard time actually getting in to Buenos Aires. So meanwhile, we have uh, Admiral Brown, who was, um, was actually an Irishman, I believe. He, uh, he started attracting privateers, uh, likewise, from all around. And those privateers are very successful against Brazilian shipping. And uh, to the point where they, he wasn't even allowed, um, necessarily 
uh, putting restrictions on them coming into their home ports so they could actually go and return with their prize goods to neutral Caribbean ports, dispose of them, and then uh, continue privateering. <clears throat> so um, their success of emancipations, so ending uh, the institution of slavery itself uh, by Britain in 1834, France in 1848, Denmark the same year, the Netherlands in 1863, and Lastly, by Spain, which results in the successive decline in the illegal transatlantic slave trade simply because the demand for enslaved Africans wasn't there because the institution successively ceased to exist. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so within this project, now that we have some background set up here, there's five research objectives. So the first one here, I'm looking to find the entanglements between international, regional, and local factors that drove St. Thomas, St. Eustatius, St. Bart's, Seba, and St. Martin to engage in illicit trade. I'm also looking at how these islands function together as a network for illicit trade, smuggling, and laundering, <clears throat> the processes that were involved, and how long it occurred. So for the third, I'm looking at uh, the dialectics between, so um, to back up here, a dialectic uh, is... Um, uh, a way of studying something by understanding it as um, two things, understanding the relation between two things rather than understanding them in opposition to each other. So a good example is, um, say, like a husband and wife. So they are defined by the institution of marriage in this regard. So when the relationship between them, so when the marriage ceases to exist, they are no longer husband and wife, they're ex-husband and ex-wife. So it is the relationship between them that defines their marriage. So when the marriage ceases to exist, they become something else. We study the relationships here. So what are the dialectics between the acquisition of these illicit goods, consumptions of these goods, um, the race, class, and gender of these um, <clears throat> consumers uh, as a means to understand who purchased them, uh, and who took these legal risks, and how did it scale according to uh, race, class, and gender? Number four, so we're looking at the archaeological uh, evidence of these activities, in particular uh, shipwrecks. And fifth, so how does illicit trade from this period involve, <clears throat> sorry, inform uh, modern theories of piracy uh, proposed by scholars in uh, the 21st century? So next slide. So to briefly uh, outline the methodology for uh, the first two research objectives, um, it's largely complete. Uh, I've been working on this uh, in particular over the past 11 years. So. The bulk of the archive research has already been completed. Um, this includes uh, uh, many levels of correspondence, either private correspondence, diplomatic correspondence, local government correspondence, um, harbor master records, which show um, records of incoming and outgoing ships, their tonnage and their cargoes, the names of ships and the captains, um, merchant records, uh, court records, and also um, proclamations and changes to laws on um, respective islands. So a lot of these have come from national archives, such as uh, the National Archives uh, in the UK and Q, the National Archives in the Netherlands, um, and also France, Spain, Denmark, um, in the US, Argentina, and also Colombia. So some of these are available online. Uh, the ones in France are going to be particularly important because they hold a new, basically all the archives for St. Mark's that have never been previously consulted, and they're in the process of, of being digitized right now. So I've also done uh, extensive research on regional and city archives rele <clears throat> relevant to the research here. So I've done all the research, uh, Cure's House complete. Uh, read the local archives of Seba is done. And like I said, there's the archives for St. Barks that are available in Exxon Falls there. And also regional newspapers, um, which are um, remarkably complete. So for the, there's the Cure's House uh, Courant between uh, 1815 and 1830, uh, about uh, Three quarters of the way through that, and it's available for almost. Uh, uh, it's, it was published twice a week, and I would say the collection is about ninety-five percent complete. Full, so it's a very, very valuable resource. Uh, the same goes for the uh, Saint, uh, the Saint Thomas Times. For the same time period, it's also very complete, and there's also many American, British, and Dutch newspapers in the time. So, and then there's also the uh, Transatlantic Slave Voyages database, uh, which will also be. Uh, uh, good source here for determining the names of ships and so forth that were uh, that were captured um, by the British and Dutch as part of the illegal transatlantic slave trade. Uh, next. So regarding, I'll try and make this brief here. So regarding the Harbor Master records, one of the things I'm going to do here is to digitize them. 
So we get um, digitized records of all the ships coming into a particular port for a particular year, which includes their names, captain, tonnage, um, where, uh, where they're coming from and where they're going to. So once we get that, we can overlap it with um, corresponding records from other islands for the same year in order to start getting um, uh, a functional map of trade that shows the, say, the, the, the amount of trade happening between a particular island, the amount of times it was visited. Uh, we can start tracing the path of ships as they go. And the idea here is, of course, the more islands we get, the more complete this becomes. But importantly, uh, as part of smuggling, the idea is that you don't want to leave document trail. So back then, um, that was a little harder to coordinate if you know you, you can have corrupt officials in one port, but if you don't know them in a second port, they might actually just record you as you're coming in. So um, what would happen what would happen here, for example, um, if you were working out of uh, Havana as an illegal transatlantic slave trader, out of Cuba, they would record that you're going to West Africa. But what would actually happen is that they would be rerouted. Um, they would actually sail to St. Thomas to resupply over there, basically to re-outfit their ship as a slaver, and then maybe go to St. Bart's, pick up some crew members, which I'll detail later, and then actually go over. And uh, then the return trip, of course, they're not mentioning that they're taking these enslaved Africans, dropping them off on different islands, and then returning to Havana in ballast. So all they're seeing in Havana is a trip to West Africa and back. But what's actually happening is we're getting records of this same ship appearing uh, for this voyage in St. Thomas and St. Barts. So by doing this, by matching these harbor master records together, we can actually see ships that appear where they should and ships maybe that don't appear when they should as well. So um, that can also be part of disasters. Say a ship didn't make it because there was a hurricane or it was captured by pirates, for example. But uh, going back to the regional newspapers, disasters like that and captures by pirates were very often recorded um, because it was popular news back then. So if that did happen, it would be mentioned in the news. So in that sense, um, we can eliminate those two if it appears in the news and then infer that it was in fact like a smuggling operation going on. Uh, next slide. So uh, just a quick sample here. Um, these are a very simple chart that you can make uh, with directional network analysis. Uh, it can get very messy, uh, especially when you start getting a lot of, um, uh, like say nodes, but uh, what, what we have here, is just a sample uh, with St. Thomas in orange and Curacao in brown. So this could be an example of, uh, say, the big, the big arrow you see pointing to the left here. So that's uh, a very large weighted arrow. So that's showing, you know, we'd have a table there, uh, a very large volume of trade going from St. Thomas to Puerto Rico. Uh, and then the thin lines would indicate a lot less trade and so forth. So uh, um, you know, this is just single direction. You can have like. Uh, Two different directions so you can, you can make many different uh many different maps with the data we have with this but uh, it's important to see basically the relations the, the trade relations the islands have and the strength uh, between these trade relations that we can expose with this uh next okay and uh quickly here so who are the privateers pirates merchants and buyers of these illicit goods so we can get this data from public auctions merchant sales records and public census records and match it with cargoes of incoming illicit trade vessels uh, that we can see um, from the harbor master records, because oftentimes, you know, we either determine them from uh, from the network analysis or they're simply just mentioned in the news as being, you know, this is the privateer that everyone knows, but you know, they're not recording it in, in the harbor master records because you know we, we do the length of the nod. Um, it, it is one thing to actually keep in mind here that. Uh, despite the fact that you have these ships that are making all these these efforts to you know conceal their identities a privateer and and uh, and all their legal posturing but since these ships are coming back and forth so much most residents knew exactly what the ships were and who was on them so the local population knew it's just not necessarily appearing in the books and this is actually mentioned very overtly a few times in, in print records uh, about public knowledge i mean this is you know, things like this being common public knowledge. Uh, next. So um, how we find archeological evidence uh, of piracy here. So again, with the, uh, using dialectics here, we begin by understanding the social processes tied to a site or artifact, rather than looking at, you know, uh, pirate artifacts, you look at, well, what constitutes a pirate artifact? How is it entangled in acts of piracy? So, 
uh, a very good one here um, are just, you know, the large artifacts, which here are shipwrecks. So uh, at, in 1828 alone, there were three to five captured ships that were intentionally sunk between Seba and St. Eustatius um, per week. So what would happen here is a privateer or a pirate would take in uh, a prize ship to St. Eustatius. And if it wasn't uh, going to be laundered through Seba, which we'll talk about later and resold regionally, most of the time it was sunk to hide evidence of piracy because nobody wants to be caught as a pirate because you were simply hung. Uh, so what would happen is, in most cases, the, uh, the ship was stripped of all valuables and filled with ballast, and at night it was taken out to deep water by rowboat and sunk. So by doing that, we have a, a quick little model we can make. So if they're leaving out of St. Eustatius, preferably they don't want to be within sight of St. Kitts. It has to be deep enough water that when you look down, you're not going to see a ship. And also close enough that you can safely return to shore, especially being at night. And so like in this area, we also know there's no large battles or no mass losses of vessels from, from hurricanes. So if we have clusters of ships, they are not only from this most certainly associated with, uh, with this period of piracy being ships that were intentionally sunk during the early 19th century, but they also have no artifacts. All we're going to see are big piles of ballast in, uh, in deep water. So in order to find these, um, uh, we've got uh, two means of doing it. So there's side scan sonar, uh, which takes a, a two-dimensional uh, two view of the seafloor. And then there's multi-beam side scan sonar, which produces a 3D map of the seafloor. So initially you'd go over it with, uh, with side scan sonar. Once you find targets, then you go over it with the multi-beam, which is a bit of a slower process. So then um, uh, with particular racks or particular clusters, we can send in an ROV to investigate uh, these clusters of vessels. So with that too, we can actually get a, a much better view of uh, basically confirming the absence of artifacts. So we find a ship, we find a pile of ballast, there's no associated artifacts, we find clusters of them, we can very strongly infer that these were associated, that these were intentionally sunk uh, as part of the piracy of this period. So on top of that, this also has the added benefit of producing uh, values maps and maps for, um, for basically for nature foundations because none of these seas have been mapped, uh, or, or sorry, have, have had bathymetric maps produced. So even in these islands territorial waters, they're working blind. So, you know, for governments themselves, for the NGOs uh, involved in cultural heritage and uh, nature conservation. So this will be a very valuable uh, resource for them. And on top of that, it's important to note too that these are not treasure ships, these are ships that were stripped of valuables and have nothing of value except ballast. So, and they're in very deep water. So it's, um, there's no risk in publishing this information. So this is information that can be made public without a risk of treasure hunters going in and destroying the sites. Uh, next slide, please. So this also helps to inform uh, current theories of piracy, uh, which in the interest of time, we have to go over too much. But there's quite a few that have been put out there, such as piracy as forms of resistance to cycles of capitalism, to pirates as collectivists or egalitarians or anti-authoritarians or pirates as the preeminent rational choice theorists in a very uh, Ayn Randian way. Um, and also to pirates as exemplary capitalists or even millennial capitalists who are defined by their consumption rather than production. Um, so, for this research, I'm looking more at the, you know, rather than opposition, again, I'm looking at dialectics. So piracy here is being informed um, by the acquisition and consumption of illicit goods um, within this period of an expansion of decline of uh, 19th century Caribbean piracy. So, yeah, so, and then also looking at the utility of illicit trade by people that are intentionally abusing loopholes and working, but we're also you know, working within legally recognized bounds and, and, and international frameworks. So we have pirates posing, posing as privateers, pirate, uh, you know, privateers that are, are emerging on piracy. We have um, letters of mark that are sent out by contested nation states. So if, you know, Buenos Aires writes a letter of mark and you are, say, uh, the, uh, with the British Navy and, you know, you can pull over this uh, Buenos Aires and uh, uh, privateer, you know, what, what do you do? Do you recognize it? This is a letter of mark. It was issued by their state. 
everything seems legal. However, your government does not necessarily recognize the state. So, for example, in this in this situation, uh, the UK wanted to covertly support, uh, say, one of their independence, um, especially because there was a lot of potential trade involved, but they couldn't overtly do it because they didn't want to anger Spain and complicate any politics to have with them. So every time this happened, it was it was it was a complicated meeting. And the thing is, um, the crews on these ships knew it, and they took very, uh, they, they took advantage of it too. And that's how um, they worked within all these gray areas um, that, that were popping up during this time, which uh, I'll be able to discuss here just after this. Uh, next. Okay, so, so for the rest of the presentation here, I'm gonna more discuss the, the results of uh, Search Objective 1 and 2 um, because it's been mostly completed and, uh, and it'll really help to inform some of the things I've been discussing here. So the political and economic environments of St. Thomas, St. Bart, Seba, and Station between 1816 to 1830. Um, yeah, so we're, we're used as a, as a smuggling ring to help launder people, goods, ships, and, and, and goods that were brought to these islands. Uh, next slide. So um, first off, we need to know the difference between a private, a pirate and a privateer. So a privateer is best thought of as a mercenary. So it's a mercenary ship uh, employed by a nation to make war on an enemy. So in order to differentiate your ACF, uh, legally have a privateer from a pirate, a privateer is issued a letter of mark from the nation to prove this. So on this letter of mark, which is an example over here of um, a letter of mark issued by uh, Columbia, so it came with a, a specific period of time. So the privateer was allowed to work as a privateer, say, for two years starting in this date and ending on that date. If they are privateering before or after this date, they're considered pirates. It's no longer legal. However, the important part is that if you are captured by the enemy as a privateer, then you are tried as, uh, as a soldier. So which means, you know, you can be brought to court, you can be thrown in jail. If you're caught as a pirate, you're simply executed. Um, it's usually a put trials and, and, and very few questions asked. So uh, on top of that, though, we have privateers that may have been, you know, abusive, that, that were abusing uh, letters of mark too. Uh, some letters of mark simply have their dates changed. Um, some letters of mark were sent off um, as complete blank stacks. So for example, one of series did this quite often where they would send mass stacks of blank letters of mark to merchant houses in St. Thomas and St. Barks especially. And the merchant houses would use these as a basis to, to attract and, uh, and sponsor their own privateering missions. So what would happen here is they would, uh, they would say, we have these blank letters of mark. Um, we will provide a startup capital to get the ship, uh, to provision your ship, to, uh, to bring your crew over. And the only provision here is, you know, the merchant house themselves would serve as the prize master rather than the captain of the ship. So they would not be making nearly as much money, um, that, well, at least for the prices of the capture that would be reported, as they would if they were working on their own accord. However, uh, doing it this way allowed uh, a means of security for these, well, they're pirates, uh, in that all the smuggling and laundering and outfitting was done and taken care of by the merchant house. So all they had to do was turn up with the prize ship at you know, particular points. Uh, meet with particular people and then everything else is done for them and they got paid. So it was actually uh, quite a bit safer uh, in a way than, um, and then committing acts of piracy on your own and then having to try and dispose of the prize goods uh, you know, on your own accord. Uh, next. Uh, yeah, we, we did this too. Uh, next. Yeah, so, uh, so again here, so um, this is a bit uh, redundant, but yeah, so during the Napoleonic Wars um, between 1795-1815, uh, Spain had no navy, the Republican armies had no navy. Um, yeah, everyone starts bringing in privateers. Uh, the Russia privateers also attracted pirates that were taking advantage of the swarm of privateers in there to pose as uh, privateers themselves. So uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, we discuss this here. Next slide. Yeah, so with all the uh, 
Yeah, I'm gonna leave that right here. Um, so just to go over some of the countries that are involved over here for people that might not be uh, familiar with the geography. So we're dealing with Spain. Uh, over here, a lot of the, uh, the privateering for Spain was done out of Cadiz and also Puerto Rico. Um, a lot was done on, out of the US from Baltimore, uh, from Cuba out of Havana. A lot of the illegal transatlantic slave trading was done out of Senegal. There's Sao Tome and Principe, um, which was also a destination for acquiring enslaved Africans, especially by the Portuguese. But importantly, it was also uh, south of the equator. So that meant uh, Britain and the Netherlands couldn't actually prosecute uh, illegal slave training ships um, if they were below the equator. So it was actually quite a lucrative destination. So there's Seba and St. Eustatius uh, here in the Northeastern Caribbean. There's some privateering um, by Mexico out of Veracruz. Uh, and here we have the equivalent here, Gran Colombia, the Liga Federal, which is more or less now Uruguay, and then Buenos Aires. So uh, next. Yeah, so one of the things um, I didn't mention here too is, is along with hiding behind fake letters of mark, uh, there's almost, Every every pirate ship all, during this time carried different sets of flags. So they would carry, say, Dutch flags, French flag, uh, French flags, the Buenos Aires flag, and then also a complete set of ship's papers for each of them. And then on top of that, uh, in order to take it, you know, these, they, these these flags would be flown depending on who was stopping them. So as an even added measure, they would also have crew members uh, that would say were. Uh, Spanish-speaking crew members, they have French-speaking crew members, Dutch-speaking crew members, that if they need to come, or if the need came up, they would assemble this, this skeleton crew together and say, okay, um, it's, it's, a, it's a French ship, okay, so we need a, we need a Spanish crew, okay, so you, you're, you're, you're now the supercargo, you're not the captain, uh, and so forth. So then these actors would come up and pretend to, to be, you know, basically to help pose and say like a, a Spanish ship flying a Spanish flag with a Spanish crew. So uh, next. So there's a process for capturing ships at sea here too. So privateers would stop merchant ships and react according to the flag hoisted by uh, the merchant ship. So their ship's logs would be inspected, their destinations determined, and the goods themselves inspected for their origin. So are they going to say uh, an enemy port? So if they were cleared, um, the ship was allowed to continue. However, some ships were made guilty. So there's one example uh, that popped up in the Kirchhoff's Courant where uh, there was a merchant ship that was going to Cuba uh, out of St. Thomas, so like, you know, perfectly legal voyage under you know any circumstance here. So it was stopped by a Spanish privateer, and they said, "Well, our destination is now Curacao." So the captain of the privateer uh, put a gun to the cap the other captain said, "And say, if you don't write me a letter saying you're going to Maracaibo, I'm going to blow your brains out." So this is reported in Curacao, but still, uh, he wrote the letter saying he's going to Maracaibo, and then his ship was condemned and then brought into port. Uh, over there um, in, into a Spanish royalist port. So otherwise, if a, if a ship was found guilty by the privateers, uh, there's a, another process that occurred here too. So either the, the original crew was imprisoned and put on board the next passing ship, or they were the ship itself was captured and they were brought to their home port by the privateer for trial. Uh, next. Okay, so we discussed here the illegal transatlantic slave trade briefly. So this is first informed by the successive abolitions of the transatlantic slave trade uh, by uh, nations, but the institution of slavery remained, which fueled the demand for enslaved Africans. Uh, so next. So I uh, discussed this briefly here, but there's a process um, that was typical for voyages out of Havana that were participating in the illegal transatlantic slave trade. So the ship would be outfitted at Havana with the Spanish passport flag and ships registered. And they would start with just a skeleton crew because they needed more crew members to pose as members from other countries. So in the Harbor Master records, the ship would depart for West Africa and Havana. However, they would make a detour to St. Eustatius, St. Thomas and St. Marks, where they would get uh, Dutch, Danish, French passports, flags and ships registers. Uh, the French, Danish and Dutch crew members uh, were hired to stand-ins, uh, lumber was bought at St. Thomas or St. Mark's to re-outfit the ship as a slave ship off the coast of West Africa. So when they're sailing, um, uh, they would be 
basically they would be a cargo ship, but once they hit the coast of West Africa, they would completely re outfit, they become a completely different kind of ship. So they, they would re outfit in order to hold and save Africans on the ship and then and then bring them back over uh, to uh, the Caribbean. Uh, next. So uh, the ship would arrive on the coast of West Africa or the island of Principe where they'd re-outfit as a slaver. So if they went to West Africa, the ship usually proceeded up a river, um, which were typically not patrolled by the British or the Dutch, uh, to a designated location to purchase enslaved Africans. Uh, the ship would then return to the Caribbean, offload enslaved Africans to buyers on secluded beaches or other secluded um, areas. And then a ship would return to Havana officially in ballast or it would Instead, it would mean that return to Havana, it would just be stripped and resold in St. Thomas or St. Bart's, and the ship would just be laundered again and again and again, uh, all the way throughout the region. So it would make it actually very hard to track down. So, uh, so here again, so again, apologies for the interruption here. So we're looking at, so why save us St. Martin, St. Bart's, St. Thomas, and St. Eustatius as destinations for illicit trade? And why did they participate in it? So Spain often captured and held rebel ports on the Spanish main. So what happens is this not only disconnects privateers from their home ports, but when privateers are at sea, these events can occur without their knowledge. So if they were to make prize ship captures, they are always, uh, unless, they, unless they can get news as fast as possible when they're approaching uh, the coast, they're taking uh, risk into their own hands every time they approach their home port because it could simply be in Spanish hands and they wouldn't even have to enter the port itself. They could be just outside the port and then they could be swarmed uh, by Spanish privateers and then brought in and then uh, condemned. So in order to, uh, to mitigate this risk, uh, they would uh, often instead bring their prize ships into neutral ports, such as those of the Swedes, uh, the Danes and the Dutch. So, um, so this occurred not only, um, you know, with, with uh, support by merchants, but then also by governing officials themselves. So uh, we can do the next slide. So for example, so why St. Marks? So St. Marks is already a regional trade center by 1795. And the Swedish crown wanted close contacts with revolutionaries, although implicitly, uh, they, they explicitly didn't recognize the colonies as independent, but they still wanted to trade. So everything had to be relatively covert. So um, merchants on, uh, on St. Bart's uh, often met with, uh, with Bolivar, with uh, Brion, which was, uh, Louis Brion was a, a native born Curacao, and he was the, uh, the admiral of Bolivar's Navy. And they also had agents placed on the island too. So on, uh, on St. Bart's, you could acquire citizenship there um, for as low as um, one Spanish dollar. However, by doing this, it had quite uh, quite some benefits there. So it protected you from prosecution at home for privateering for one. And importantly, it helped to prevent debt collection um, by your now foreign creditors. So if you're escaping debts, uh, St. Bart's was actually a, a fantastic place to go. So it also served as a quote unquote one-stop shop for um, outfitting crews, for disposing of cargo, and, um, and also for, um, yeah, outfitting crews, disposing of cargo and getting them together. Uh, this differs by, with St. Thomas and, and St. Bart's there, sorry, with uh, St. Thomas, St. Eustatius and Seba in that they were more overt about it. They weren't really trying to conceal their activities as much. So this is very often written about in newspapers that, you know, we saw privateers entering St. Bart's and leaving St. Bart's or uh, more even, even uh, outright pirates. So nothing was really done about it. Uh, and that is, um, on one hand, um, the, the responsibility of the governor over there was actively supporting this too, but also uh, between St. Martin and St. Bart's, there's a group of islands called the, the Five Islands. So they were, belong to St. Bart's and they're, they're basically just large rocks um, over there. Some of them have uh, some, some, some sheltered bays and so forth, but those were very often uh, used by pirates and privateers as uh, as drop off points for for goods. So if they didn't want to necessarily drop off goods directly into St. Barks, they would drop off goods on the five islands, and then boats would simply come, like rowboats even, would come over from St. Barks to these five islands, pick them up, and then return them to St. Barks. So uh, next slide. Uh, so for an example here of uh, the more over 
uh, illicit trade that was occurring uh, on St. Bart's. So it says here, uh, this is an extract from uh, the Kirchhoff Vent from uh, 1818. So it says, at St. Bart's, they have lately sold goods from on board the Portuguese prize ship bought there by privateers under Artigas' commission. One of the more respectable merchants there uh, remonstrated with the government in a strong memorial about the impropriety and dangerous consequences of permitting this traffic so openly in the face of day and etc. The governor had him immediately imprisoned on charge of high trees. His trial was to come today. It has put St. Bart's into a state of fermentation and caused some disturbance. Next slide. Uh, in the interest of time, we can skip this one. So uh, why St. Thomas? So St. Thomas itself was a regional and international trade center uh, during the early uh, 1800s, uh, but they took a, a more um, nuanced uh, approach to engaging with, uh, with pirates and privateers. So one governor in particular, uh, Peter von Stolten, uh, was the favorite of the Danish king uh, at the time. And through his relations with the king, he was able to negotiate himself uh, very lucrative and profitable positions uh, within the Danish islands. So on St. Thomas, he started with a request to the king to be chief scalesman. Then he asked the king to be mayor of Charlotte Amalia, which he then was promoted to. And then captain of the militia, which he was then promoted to, and then governor of St. Thomas. However, he would kept all the previous positions he had. So he amassed a very considerable amount of power and influence on the island. So basically anything that happened was occurring through him and he was profiting directly from this, especially um, by being chief scalesman. Because it's a, it's, it's a very lucrative opportunity effectively to, um, to collect bribes um, uh, from ships that, are, that had to go and check in at the scale house. So on top of that, he allowed merchant houses to finance uh, expeditions. Uh, like we described before there. And this is all done with a wink and nod. He knew what was going on. The merchant houses knew what was going on, but it was all supposed to be very covert. So on top of that, uh, importantly on St. Thomas, uh, the customs house, which Shulton was also uh, in charge of, would not forward ships registers or other official documents to corresponding consulates or embassies. So for example, if you had, um, if you had say an American ship that was calling into port in St. Thomas that might have been engaging in illicit activities, they could be assured that uh, important documents that would implicate them, say like their ship manifest or their muster roll, would not be forwarded to the U.S. consulate because then they might actually be tried as you know working for a foreign government. They're discouraging privateering in the U.S. or even if they're outright pirates, they could be you know discovered as pirates and then tried as them. So by not forwarding this correspondence, it provided a means of security for them. Next slide. So despite this, uh, St. Thomas would not openly receive Republican pirates and privateers. So what would happen is if uh, a, merchant, um, a pirate ship or a privateer is being outfitted, all of this would happen away uh, from St. Thomas. It wouldn't happen in the port, it would happen in the relatively open sea. So a ship would be outfitted by rowboats or different, you know, different ships would meet with each other. They would exchange crews, they would exchange goods, and, and, and the ship that was destined to be the privateer or the pirate uh, would be outfitted that way. Also, in order uh, to, uh, as an order of uh, basically uh, to take the liability off himself, the governor would also demand uh, what was called a security. So every expedition that was outfitted at a merchant house would have to deposit a security with the merchant house and then also with uh, Sultan himself, which is usually like 10,000 pieces of weight. It was very considerable. And that was saying that we will not engage in acts that might compromise the position of St. Thomas within the waters of St. Thomas. So basically out of sight, out of mind. However, that also um, very strongly encouraged the, uh, the pirate or the privateer to return to St. Thomas uh, not only to, you know, properly dispose of the goods in the nearby islands, but also to collect that security. So it basically guaranteed that whatever prizes that, you know, um, were collected by uh, the pirate or the privateer were being returned for circulation, you know, eventually within St. Thomas rather than somewhere else. So throughout all of this, um, all of these profits that Fulton was collecting weren't necessarily going to him. He was actually taking out quite a few loans during this time and actually died poor. Uh, they were going to, they were actually funneled to the king of, uh, of Denmark. 
Uh, not only that, but uh, the King of Denmark had several illegitimate children and it was going towards a secret bank account in order to help support them uh, throughout their lives. Of course, after he died, this was founded by the next king and the uh, bank account was emptied. Uh, next slide. So uh, we discussed here too that the, the kind of piracy that was going on here is it was a different kind of piracy than uh, than we saw in previous centuries, say in the, the 16th and 17th century. So here we have merchant houses on St. Thomas and Simbars that were sponsoring, which were effectively pirate expeditions. And we discussed here that the merchant houses would provide the startup capital. The merchant house became the prize master rather than the captain of the ship. And uh, so in this, um, this didn't happen before. So there's never merchant houses that were effectively sponsoring pirate expeditions that happened uh, uh, before this time. So it's quite unique. Uh, next. So then there's also the temptation of illicit trade that was going on here. So we talked about the stacks of blank letters of mark that were sent from Buenos Aires. Um, you even have um, former consuls uh, that saw how lucrative this trade was that jumped in. So in one example, we have the former U.S. consul of St. Thomas. His name was Stephen Cabot. Uh, he quit being American consul on St. Thomas. And that same year, he founded the Merchant House Cabot & Co., which became a, a notorious merchant house for sponsoring pirate expeditions out of St. Thomas. So there's several accounts of large, legitimate merchant ships that were in port in St. Thomas and, and St. Parts that often lost crew members in port that just simply went off and then joined uh, privateers or guinea men. Guinea men then was a reference to, uh, to illegal transatlantic slave trade vessels. So on top of that, um, pirates and privateers, especially pirate ships, uh, had to ensure for their own safety that their crew was 100% on board with what they were doing. So we discussed before that they were making every measure they could to show that what they were doing is not piracy, we are privateers, you know, here's our letter of mark with, you know, with, with a forged date on it. Or, um, you know, uh, they, they're trying to ferment uh, as much support as they could for, you know, say Buenos Aires, even though none of them actually set foot in Buenos Aires, you know, they say we're going to fight for this flag. Um, on top of that, if there had some problem crew members, uh, often what would happen is they would be in port in St. Bart's or St. Thomas and they would record them as being sick or record them as being runaways. So then they just purged their uncooperative crew, crew members that way. And the problem with this is when they report as a sick, um, generally a, a sick, sick crewman was responsibility of, uh, of the captain himself. But then when the captain leaves, then this, this, this crew member is basically left with no support at all. Uh, and that eventually became a problem on St. Thomas and St. Barts because uh, it's happened quite a bit. Uh, next. Um, yeah, next, in the interest of time. Uh, so quickly, so YC Eustatius, it was the largest trading center in the world up to 1795. However, by the early 19th century, it uh, had a depressed economy. And then after it was returned to the Dutch again, after the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, the tax regime um, fought, you know, encouraged by the British also made sure that uh, it didn't regain its former status. So, however, with illicit trade here, um, the island governments and police chiefs were also directly involved. And it served as a destination where Dutch ships, papers, flags, and passports were sold to pirates and privateers, and also where prize cargoes could be offloaded directly in St. Eustatius and, and stored in uh, warehouses that were uh, on the coast in Aranya Bay. So these goods were then reshipped in legitimate ships uh, to St. Barts and St. Thomas. So, say uh, a merchant vessel would then just simply uh, sail from St. Thomas to St. Eustatius pick up the solicit cargo and sail back. So on paper, it simply registers as a voyage to St. Statius and back again. So it's effectively laundered back into markets. So um, illegal prize ships uh, brought there were often sunk also out of St. Statius, and it also served as a point to begin cruises and end cruises. So crews would be assembled there and crews would also be paid at the end of the cruise uh, on St. Statius. Uh, next slide. However, because this is so covert, uh, St. Eustatius became publicly notorious as a place that would actively uh, support piracy. So uh, on a notable quote here from the Baltimore Gazette in 1829, uh, say it's convenient arrangement by which St. Thomas may enjoy the profits of the trade and St. Eustatius answer for its consequences. So next slide. So then why Seba? 
So lastly here, so it's a defenseless island with poor economy yet famous for shipbuilding and seafaring. Um, it also provided sailors to uh, Louis Brion uh, in 1818. Specifically, Brion went to Seva and no other islands around. Here. So um, I haven't seen anything else on it, but it's very curious. So ships that were brought to St. Eustatius that weren't sunk and were um, rather wanted to be laundered back into regional markets were instead brought to Seva and simply left at anchor uh, off the island empty. So officials on Seva, even, you know, uh, residents on Seva would see this, this ship that's just at anchor empty. And, you know, eventually after a couple of days, you know, um, something would have to be done. So what would happen is the governor uh, would say, oh, well, there's there's this uh, empty ship at anchor. How curious. Um, I'm going to send some carpenters down to inspect the ship and often it needed repairs. And during this time, uh, there would be a merchant on St. Eustatius that would then write the governor saying, oh, I just got word that, um, that my merchant ship uh, suddenly appeared off your island, yet it was captured by pirates at sea. And it's quite miraculous, you know, that it appeared off your coast. However, the pirates disposed of all the ship's papers in the process of capturing. So if you'd please be so kind as to furnish me with a new set of ship's papers proving my ownership, you know, I'd be grateful. So the governor would get a cut for this, for doing that. And then uh, what would happen is the ship would be brought to Wells Bay, which is in the north, uh, the north uh, west of Seba. And the ship would be uh, painted over, it would be repaired, um, any evidence of its former self uh, would try and try and be erased or destroyed. So any, you know, any parts of the ship that might seem made in Liverpool were, were chipped away. And the ship was given a new name. And so eventually it was picked up by um, the person who was claiming it in St. Eustatius and then brought back into local markets to be resold at auction. So next. Uh, we can do next. Uh, next again. Uh, next. And next, I've discussed this. Yeah, we discussed this too. And that one. Next. Yeah, I discussed that too. Yeah, so here's an interesting quote of uh, what I just discussed. So it's a direct observation of uh, the activities that were going on at Wells Bay. So this is from uh, the St. Thomas Times in, in uh, actually, sorry, this is from uh, uh, the Danish National Archives. So translated from Danish, it says, a Captain Klauman sailed tightly around the little island or cliff of Seba, where he found a bay on the northwest side resembling a seafarer harbor, for in addition to three half sunken and abandoned schooners, whose names were painted over, the whole coast was concealing masts, rods, ribs, bowsprits, booms, boats, and fragments of ships. Also, some people were employed by his approach to carry boxes and packs up on the mountain. So, uh, next slide. Yeah, um, next slide. In the interest of time. So, okay, so why did this trade stop? So, this was the last use of privateers uh, in the Western Hemisphere, so it's the swan song. Uh, it's also um, the end of the Cisplatine War also uh, stopped a demand for, for privateering uh, against Buenos Aires, so that came to an end around the 1830s. Uh, another reason is the world uh, famous case of uh, Las Damas Argentinas, um, which happened around 1828, which I don't necessarily have time to get into, but it was basically uh, um, the, the process as I described um, were followed by um, the captain of the ship of Las Damas Argentinas, and he was he was brazenly caught by uh, British authorities, who then started an investigation. And it uh, because of all the acts that occurred, and and you know all the processes involved in laundering and smuggling the the good ships and the people with the ship, it became uh, world uh, world famous. And this was appearing in newspapers all around the world during this time. So St. Eustatius and Seba became absolutely infamous for for piracy. And as a result, it, it formed um, a renewed push um, uh, by European powers to then and the US to actually stop piracy. So it, it, it declined quite drastically after this time. And then there's also a decline in, in demand for enslaved Africans um, after successive uh, uh, declarations of emancipation, which then of course stopped the demand for enslaved Africans as time went on. Uh, next. All right, so uh, to summarize here, so, 
So we have piracy, smuggling, and laundering in the Northeastern Caribbean in the early 19th century. So the political environment of St. Bart's allowed it to serve as a standalone island for brazen covert trade with privateers and illegal slave traders, an island for merchant houses to sponsor pirate cruises, and as a destination to directly dispose of illicit cargoes. So this process, of course, ultimately enriched the Swedish state. The blind eye, quote unquote, political environment of St. Thomas covertly supported illicit trade at the highest echelons and by necessity fostered an illicit trade and slave trading network involving St. Eustatius and Seba as subsidiaries uh, to serve as depots for smuggling and laundering illicit ships, goods, captive Africans, and sailors associated with these activities back into St. Thomas along with the prophets. So I also noticed St. Martin was involved in this, but it appears rarely in the documentary record from what I've seen so far, but there are cases where St. Martin is also kind of a cog in this wheel involving uh, uh, smuggling and laundering uh, out of St. Thomas. So next. So past this, there's uh, going to be deliverables with this project. Uh, so there's parts of what I discussed. So to summarize everything here, there's going to be a public oriented volume detailing all the research as a result. Uh, there's going to be a documentary of the research and research processes done. Uh, this is also going to include uh, interviews with local residents involving memories of piracy. And uh, I have uh, two major television networks that have expressed interest in this. So there's the bathymetric maps that will produce underwater cultural heritage and uh, also moment of survey fish schooling um, for island governments and relative NGO, relevant NGOs. Uh, there's the digitized harbor master records and directional trade network analysis maps uh, for maritime trade for the Eastern Caribbean, but then also the digitized harbor master records themselves uh, will serve as a very valuable resource for historians because um, something like this has never been not only assembled together, but the fact that it's simply searchable uh, is, is uh, going to be the foundation of probably uh, several interesting projects after this. And then also at least uh, two peer reviewed journals concerning uh, illicit trade and the maritime survey results. Uh, next. Yeah, and, uh, thanks for your attention. And uh, again, sorry with the interruption. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. We'll give you a round of applause for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Thank you for sharing your thank very you. interesting project and your um well kind of some of the, the the preliminary results and things we can expect um and um i would like to open the floor for just a brief few questions we only have about 10 minutes left so um please do raise your hand or drop a question in the chat if i don't see anything soon then i will uh drop in my own question let's see if there are any hands Any hands, any hands, any hands? Okay, here I go. So um, one of the things that really um, sparked my attention was in your research questions, uh, Ryan, you mentioned looking at kind of uh, race, class, gender. And I was wondering if you could share how maybe you're seeing those come through in, in interesting ways in the archival research that you've done so far in the ship logs and so on, in the roles of the privateers and the smuggling, in particular, maybe in the roles of indigenous people and also maroon communities that also were involved in their own ways on the kind of borders of, of these um, of these illicit kind of trades and so on. Yeah, um, I don't have muster roles yet uh, for privateers. Um, I'm that that's one of the things I'm looking for, uh, especially in the archives of uh, Buenos Aires, um, and also for the archives in Colombia. And if I can, um, for uh, the archives in, in Caracas as well, I have um, a colleague over there that uh, is able to to go to the archives. So I'm really hoping that he can he can come up with muster rules there. So uh, that that's one aspect of it. But I also know um, for uh, legal trade. Uh, out of St. Eustatius during this time to the, the 1810s, 1820s, uh, we have muster rolls for small regional trade ships. And a lot of those uh, regional trade ships were employing enslaved Africans uh, as crew members. And that would be, um, that, that would be the, uh, yeah, basically the task that they were assigned. Uh, not only that, but um, yeah, as you said there with, uh, with indigenous participation and so forth, uh, I don't know this for the 19th century, but certainly before that, it was quite common to 
um, especially if you were, we were a pirate, to have uh, indigenous members on board, sim uh, especially for their survival skills at sea. So when you're in the middle of the open ocean or in the middle of the, the open Caribbean, where you can't necessarily um, land your ship to go, you know, to go and, and, and get victuals and so forth, that they can supply themselves at sea. Um, within uh, with indigenous knowledge and so forth. So uh, uh, in that alone are quite valuable. Um, and then with consumption with race, class and gender, uh, yeah, it's something I wasn't able to get into um, right away, uh, simply for, for um, lack of time here. Uh, but with, um, with the census records, like I mentioned, um, we have a lot of, um, for, for the people purchasing these goods, especially as merchants, we have a lot of families that are moving back and forth between the islands, like between the merchants that might have lived in St. Stations for a few years that moved to St. Thomas and that moved to St. Barks. And because the, the census records for St. Stations are so complete, I can get um, their entire families. Uh, so, you know, the not only the um, uh, the why. Uh, the wives that were involved, um, but also their husbands, and then you can eventually see their children. And so that can be not only a basis for, um, you know, for, for family ties and family preference, maybe for certain goods, but then also, uh, yeah, of course, for, for gender. And race is also determinable through the St. Eustatius census records because it's uh, they're recorded separately. Uh, so by basically, bringing them back to these complete records I have for St. Eustatius. I don't quite, I don't know if they exist yet for St. Thomas or St. Barts, they might. I would actually really think they do for St. Barts. Um, then we can start matching those with uh, with merchant records and purchases by people uh, at auction. Um, I already have good examples from Seba of, of a vessel that landed in 1820. And it had a complete list of, of every single good that was on board the ship and every single good that was sold uh, on Seva and it records not only the price but also the purchaser. And yeah, I was able to make several interesting inferences out of there, like uh, the preference of good by gender, preference of goods by by race, uh, and then took that a step further by looking at um, public auctions, who was participating in the public auctions, and I was actually seeing that uh, um, estate auctions or uh, that were held, um, see, see, a state auction of say. Um, a Sabin of African descent was attended by other Sabins of African descent. You didn't really see white Sabins attending estate auctions of Sabins of African descent and then vice versa. So estate auctions of white Sabins typically didn't involve African descent Sabins as buyers. So I, would, um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see similar patterns on uh, the different islands there too. Thanks, Ryan. We have a question from Martin. Thanks very much, Ryan, for an intriguing talk. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about, um, in your talk, the, the, the theme of legality seems quite robust. Mm -hmm. And um, I, mean, I was just thinking two centuries earlier when um, Francis, in Francis Drake, I, I, I still don't think in any English text he's described as a pirate, he's described as a hero, whereas in every Spanish school book he's a pirate. It seems more of a political concept than does it sort of transition from being a sort of, does it become legal at some point? Or does, does or put it another way, does, does the notion of legality mm -hmm. gain momentum in kind of uh, in this global arena? Um, as in, if I'm to understand correctly, there were um, like a rise of pirate folk heroes during this time that despite their acts of piracy, um, they, it, it was overlooked because of certain deeds they might've done as well. Yeah. Or because but, because but there is a there. kind of the, the discourses that um the, i mean the notion of the i mean obviously you know in the current context the notion of legality uh can kind of be very strong in the discourse but the discourse was was the say, say for some of those heroes were they were they regarded as heroes who were breaking the law or um i i think it depends on the, the sources i'm looking at um like especially a lot of them are newspapers, but the problem with newspapers during this time, are they, they were very tightly controlled by colonial authorities. So when it comes to discussions of pirates, it's always bad. It's the bad things the pirates did, the groups, which but there is a lot. There's some very gruesome things that happened as well. Um, with the American newspapers, we see slightly different accounts um, 
but there, there's another issue that comes with that too, um, because there is there's a lot of sensationalism that was promoted in the American newspapers uh, concerning pirates, but there's not really names that were brought forth. Like there's some like Lafitte at the time, I, I would probably, if I was to, to give a full hero status, he would probably be the closest thing I can think of right now. Uh, but there was a lot of sensationalism involving, um, you know, say, say there, there's a pirate attack and all these terrible things happen to, to the people. And word was getting back, for example, to, uh, to the editors of, of Kudoshav's Provence, especially if these acts were apparently happening, you know, in their waters. Sometimes they would just say this is blatantly false, like this, this event didn't even happen. So where are you getting this? Are you just inventing these stories? And I have reason to believe that they're not trying to cover something up because, you know, it's involving a picture of some merchant ship, right? So it's readily better verifiable that, no, this ship wasn't destroyed. It appeared in harbor here and left heart, you know. So, yeah, there are some issues with that. Um, but for, from what I've seen so far, there doesn't really seem to be a lot of public support at the time for pirates. Uh, simply because it was it, it was very widespread during this time, and especially around Cuba, um, there was a lot of ruthlessness, um, despite the sensationalism. Like it seems to be true ruthlessness that was that was involved with these pirates, which of course isn't necessarily means to gain public trust and love and support. So, thank you. Uh, thanks, Ryan. We've got just like two minutes left, so. If we have two questions as well, so I, I hope I would like to fit them both in, if possible. But please, if you do have to leave, then do leave. Ryan, is that okay if we make space for two more questions? Are you yeah, okay sure. with that? Okay. So first, Matt, and then CD, please. Thanks, Oliver, and thanks, Ryan, for a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I'm just trying to sort of think about the the bigger conclusions here of of your work and. It seems that one of the key things you're sort of saying is that certain European uh, powers at the time who had abolished slavery and slave trading and said that they were not participating in it were surreptitiously in one way or another involved and profiteering from it, or at least certain members with certain kinds of state sanctioned positions mm -hmm. were. And I was wondering firstly whether that sort of conclusion I draw from it is, is accurate. But then also, if it, if it is, how might that play into contemporary discourses in those European nations, for example, in Scandinavia, where there is a national discourse of, of those countries perhaps not being involved in slave trading or certainly not as complicit as other European nations, um, mm -hmm. and where your research potentially sort of challenges some of that contemporary discourse? Well, initially, when I was writing this proposal, I, I wanted to include um, modern day drug uh, drug trafficking and and, and, um, and and production and so forth uh, into this because even now it's um, it has so many comparisons to what was happening in the early 19th century with um, you know the drug runners and the drug production and the demand and the smuggling and the laundering and the problem is it, uh, if you, you very easily get overwhelmed you know I have two years for this you know I don't have four I don't have six um, but there's definitely many parallels that can be drawn there, um, you know, with, with the drug trade alone. Um, yeah, with, with regards to, um, um, if I'm to paraphrase what you're saying, like, like relative degrees of guilt with involvement with the transatlantic slave trade. Um, yeah, um, it, it, it seems that every single nation, even though you know, even um, even Britain. So, you know, on on official levels, they were, you know, the, the most active in, su in suppressing the uh, the transatlantic slave trade. But at the same time, a lot of these uh, vessels they were catching were, were British vessels with British crews that were that were smuggling enslaved Africans across uh, uh, across the Atlantic. So, even though the state interests were there, it certainly wasn't among the population itself and, and certain sectors. Thanks, Ryan. I think our second question, I think they left. Um, okay. So I think we could close that because that's exactly time then. So please join me, everyone, in thanking Ryan once again for, for the talk um, that luckily was able to happen in the end, despite the little hiccup. But thank you so much, Ryan. And please do join us um, next week for our next event. Josh, do you want to hop in? to talk about it or, or not?
Next week, who do we have next week? Because it's just my mind right now. Alessandra Cummins. Oh, of course, Alessandra Cummins, who is here in, in the audience with us. Please do join us for a wonderful talk next week.